Hello and welcome to the Medjlis Podcast, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty's current affairs talk show focusing on Central Asia. I'm Bruce Panier, host of the Medjlis and author of the weekly Central Asia and Focus newsletter. Kyrgyz authorities seem to have launched an all-out attack on opposition politicians and rights activists. Since October 23rd, more than two dozen of them have been detained, some taken into custody in Russia and sent back to Kyrgyzstan. And despite international criticism, President Sadr Japarov's government has intensified its efforts to silence critics. Troubling scenes of police taking veteran rights defender Aziza Abrasulova, a woman in her 70s, into custody on November 16th simply underscored the lengths Kyrgyz authorities are going to in order to mute any protest of government policies. How bad is the current campaign in Kyrgyzstan against critics? To discuss all this, I am joined by Sinat Sultanaliyeva, Central Asia researcher on Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan for Human Rights Watch, currently based in Bishkek. Ivar Dale, Senior Policy Advisor at the Norwegian Helsinki Committee, who has frequently been in Central Asia and was just in Kyrgyzstan uh, in October, I believe, right? Yes, that's right. Okay, great. Uh, you know, Thank you both for joining me. Okay, well, Ivar, since we have to go, or since you have to go, um, you know, hopefully, I'm sure Sianath will join us in a second. So, but if you can kind of walk me through, then, you know, since I, I mentioned October 23rd, that's when they stage raids on all kinds of people. Uh, you know, you, you've certainly been following events in Kyrgyzstan and, and uh, you know, and those after October 23rd. What are you seeing out there, you know, as far as the government's posturing toward critics? Well, uh, you know, if you've followed Kyrgyzstan for a while, it's um, I'm sad to say that the, the stuff that's happening right now is is uh, is very similar to to stuff that's happened in the past. So that you know, I was reading one day the the news about uh, human rights defenders detained, somebody's been jailed, and Radio Free Europe had their website blocked and now the bank account is frozen. And I'm thinking, I, this, these are news that I've read before. And of course I have, because it's it's kind of the same thing that happened in 2008, 2009 under Baki. And so I, I was looking at one article and I, th- and I thought to myself, like, you could just like exchange the name of the president and the head of the, the security services here and, and you could just re- reprint the article. You know? so, so that's... Uh, that's unfortunate and, and and sad, of course. Yeah, but does does it seem to you like the you know in the face of international criticism, it was one thing when they picked everybody up on a you know almost two dozen people on October twenty third, but you know they've been criticized by a, a number of governments, international organizations, including your own. You know, and yet they they if anything they seem to be intensifying their their uh, detentions, arrests. Uh, jailings, you know, does that tell you anything about this this particular government? You mentioned Bakiev's government it, as being comparable in some ways, uh, but but is uh, wh- wh- what does this tell you know? What does this latest campaign say about this current Kyrgyz government? Uh, well, it's it, it's hard to say where it's headed, but you know, when you see a video of of them dragging Aziza off like that, it's just uh, it's very upsetting, and it's I think it's kind of. Um, that's a line that I think they've been hesitant to to pass uh, to cross before, because uh, Aziza and and a few other uh, human rights defenders in Kyrgyzstan, like Tolikan, Ismailova, have have been have been part of the uh, you know the uh, the public scene there for so many years, and they they are respected, and they uh, and the government even knows that uh, you know if you do stuff like this, it's just going to backfire because it uh, because everybody will will perceive it in a very negative way so it's strange to me that they would they would tell the police to to treat them like that and, and I, I keep thinking that it's uh, like Kyrgyzstan has a lot of goodwill I feel I feel like everyone is sort of has been always been cheering for Kyrgyzstan you know it's it's um, it goes up and it goes down but but in for people who at least for you know for, for, for people like me who work in the human rights community we always feel, feel uh, welcome and at home uh, in Kyrgyzstan well not during the periods when we've been banned but that uh, but things change uh, you know with the with the government changes there often but you know i remember in the past and we've been when uzbekistan was closed off to international organizations after andijan or you you know the turkmen students uh, who are 
barred from going to Kyrgyzstan because the government there is worried they'll get too much uh, uh, too much of a taste of democracy at AUCA, or or even just you know when you're in Almaty and you have people there uh, putting their noses up and trying to say that they are much more advanced than Kyrgyzstan, you can tell them that well actually it, it's the other way around. I feel like um, society in Kyrgyzstan has been through a lot and it's grown through those experiences. So it's it's a much more vibrant society than than many of the other ones around in Central Asia. And then with all that sort of goodwill and people cheering for Kyrgyzstan, why does it end up in this kind of strange mess all over again? And you can say also, you remember the the dramatic events in Batkin province recently when there was an armed conflict with Tajikistan. You know, Kyrgyzstan got some uh, compliments because there were actually uh, media reports coming out from the, the events from the Kyrgyz side. Whereas on the Tajik side, we we could almost not get any independent information because they have actually you know shut down all the the free media outlets. Whereas they are still were still able to function in Kyrgyzstan. So then, a short while after, they go after uh, Azatik, the local uh, version of Radio Free Europe, and and accuse them of of having uh, having. Uh, damaged Kyrgyzstan's reputation somehow with their news reports. And I feel like uh, shutting down uh, Azatik's website, that's what's going to uh, damage Kyrgyzstan's reputation internationally, not the not the video reports that they made. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm going to get back to this in a minute because it's not just Azatik that's been having problems. Uh, but while we got Sianat on here, Sianat, can you, can you tell me what's the, um, you know, what's the mood in Bishkek right now after the detention of, of I know Abdul Rasulova was was released later, but I mean she was initially charged with with I think being intoxicated in public uh, and um, failure to to uh, obey the uh, the order of a police officer. Um, what are people in Bishkek saying about this? So with regards to the moods in 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 Bishkek at the moment, uh, generally there is a, a sense of this um, incre- increase sort of or like an increasing attacks on the civil society in general, uh, that the authorities have increased uh, the, their um, assault, basically, um, on civil society, trying to um, limit and restrict uh, in any way that's possible. And, you know, it's a, so the, the most recent thing is, uh, is Aziza's uh, detention, even though she was later, as you uh, said, she was uh, let go. Um, then before that, we had the 20 plus, uh, I think 22, 23, some, some numbers are, are saying, and the people are still detained uh, in pretrial detention for um, two months until December, and um, I've personally tried uh, finding out if it's possible to uh, go and visit them, which usually should be possible, but it is not. Uh, apparently, it's all up to you know it's at the discretion of the specific uh, investigator in the in the detention center, and they have not been letting anyone in except their their relatives, for example. Um, and then um, to top it off, you know, it, it just honestly it just feels like there is this this atmosphere of um, of um, everything just really becoming intensifying. So in, in addition to to these two things, uh, we have the um, ongoing public consideration of the draft law on non commercial non governmental um, organizations, which is basically the foreign agents law, except it doesn't use that term. Um, and I've seen um, several, you know, uh, and I've heard several experts mentioning this, that, you know, this is basically that law, except, you know, it's, it's just smarter, it doesn't use the term. Um, and then there is also the, the law on mass media. And um, with regards to the law on mass media, and I'm not sure if you've, if you've uh, mentioned this uh, before I joined, but, you know, there is some good news with regards to that, that uh, the authorities have you know, recognized that maybe, maybe, they need to um, work on, um, you know, revising the the law together with uh, journalists and media experts, and then even maybe submit it to the Venice Commission. But you know, it was only discussed at the roundtable, so we haven't really seen um, an official commitment towards this. But that's a hopeful sign, sign, I guess. But that's the only one, to be honest. So generally, there is a feeling, um, yeah, maybe that's also exacerbated by the November vibes in Bishkek. Uh, but yes, it definitely feels like. Things are uh, getting worse for civil society in Kyrgyzstan. Great, thank you. Uh, and for the benefit of, of 
audience, many members of our audience who might not be up on these two laws. Can you briefly describe what, what these two laws are doing? Uh, the one on uh, you know, NGOs and, and um, also on freedom of speech. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, the one on NGOs is, is, is really, it's basically, um, it's not an amendment to the existing um, law. Uh, it, it, it's it's a replacement um, with a lot of new um, change or changes or like new concepts introduced into into the law, which is uh, expanding very widely the um, authorities uh, and control of the government and, uh, and the you know governmental ag- agencies in general. Um, so uh, first of all, so since I started talking about this, uh, the authorities that will have uh, the power of oversight and control. Um, over non-commercial, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, basically, let's just stick to that, are the tax service, the Ministry of Justice, and the Prosecutor General's Office and the Territorial Offices of the, you know, Prosecutor's Office and the Ministry of Justice uh, throughout the country. The representatives of these uh, governmental agencies will have the right to request, any, um, you know, inform- financial information well, basically, the NGOs will be, of course, um, required to submit this information. But also, the uh, these organizations, the the agencies, will be able to attend internal meetings of the NGOs, um, and you know, to just check whether their activities are in line or in compliance with uh, their char- charters. And in case they are not, uh, they are found to be um, not in compliance with their charter, with basically you know, with the professed uh, activities of these NGOs, then the these agencies will have the right to eventually liquidate or close down these NGOs based on, um, uh, you know, on an um, arbitrary decision of uh, an employee uh, of the Ministry of Justice, Tax Service, or the, uh, the Prosecutor's Office. That's one thing. And the other thing is that uh, a really big introduction, um, which is for the worse, uh, for Kyrgyzstan, is that all NGOs, um, all non-commercial organizations, non-governmental NGO uh, organizations, will be required to register to become legal entities. This was not a requirement uh, previously, so you know um, it was sort of like it was up to the um, organ to the associations whether they want to get legal registration or not. Uh, now everybody has to be registered. Then also the time of registration. Previously, the authorities were required to make a decision on the registration within 10 days. Now it's um, up to 30 days, um, if I remember correctly, which is, yeah, it's just in- increasing the time for to, to, to refuse registration to some organizations, for example, right? Um, you know, just pro- protracting this time potentially, you know, to, until who knows, who knows when. And then... Um, and I guess the other thing is that, um, oh, yes, so in, in relation to the uh, registration, um, all existing NGOs will have to be, uh, will have to go through re-registration after this law becomes, um, you know, passes uh, and, uh, and becomes law. Uh, currently, it's a draft law form. Uh, so all of the existing, I don't know, something, 500, maybe 1,000 uh, NGOs that are operating in the country will have to go through registration. And that includes also foreign uh, NGOs and, and representative offices of international um, NGO uh, NGOs in, in, in Kyrgyzstan. And I guess one last thing with that law specifically that really uh, raises my concerns is that there is um, uh, a specific reference to, uh, at least in the, you know, in Spravka Basnavanya, which is basically like a, um, how do you call it, like a justification document for the draft law, the authorities are mentioning that this law is developed, um, among other things, to protect the Kyrgyz state um, and the constitutional order and everything, and among other things, the morality of Kyrgyz people, Kyrgyz citizens. And, and I think elsewhere within the, the draft law itself, there are also references to their morality. So one of the grounds on which uh, an NGO might be closed down is uh, if it's uh, either in its name or its activities are found to be uh, negative to, or like bringing down the morality, or you know, negative to the traditions and values of the Kyrgyz people. Um, yeah, so that's on the uh, the NGO law. Uh, the mass media law was uh, one important thing with the mass media law is that last year when Kyrgyzstan was going through the this massive sort of uh, legal inventory process. Uh, the authorities had mentioned that the mass media law would not be uh, reformed, it would not be revised. 
that was still you know up to date and maybe you know a section or two would be would be changed um, because um, i think the last time it was looked at was in the 1990s or something like that um and then this year we're seeing that there is a completely new basically 90 percent new text of the law uh, that is being proposed and it's, you know, being uh, pushed at as, 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 um, as an amendment, not a new law. And, you know, there are many really insidious s- sections in this uh, draft law, which are basically increasing or tightening control, the government con- control over mass media. Uh, but one thing that uh, I guess is especially concerning is that this law would, in addition to all mass media being, you know, having to go through registration it would also require bloggers. So anybody who has a page, anybody who has a following on any of the social media would be considered as mass media. Uh, and they would also have to go through registration. And then um, if there is no registration, then this could be a technicality on which their website is blocked um, or their you know social media page is blocked or they might be even you know brought to you know, penalized for, for non-registered activities um, as a mass media. So I think these are the some of the biggest concerns about these two laws or draft laws. Great. Thank you. You know, especially because given in the current political situation in Kyrgyzstan, it's really important to know these things uh, which are likely to pass uh, the way things are going. We've reached the halfway point, And I want to remind that this is the Middle East podcast, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's current affairs talk show focusing on Central Asia. We're discussing the deteriorating, deteriorating right situation in Kyrgyzstan. And joining me on the Middle East podcast are Ivar Dale, Senior Policy Advisor at the Norwegian Helsinki Committee, who's frequently been in Central Asia and was just in Kyrgyzstan in October, and Sianat Sultanalieva, a Central Asia researcher on Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan for Human Rights Watch, currently based in Bishkek. Ivar, I want to start with you, but I'll, uh, I'm going to ask you the same question in a minute, Sianat. You know, I've been, you've been covering and watching Kyrgyzstan for a long, long time, and, you know, and I have too. And, and I'll tell you, to get people on the show on, to discuss Kyrgyzstan in the last three or four weeks has been very, very difficult for me. A lot of, a lot of people have said no, because it's that hot a, a political situation in Kyrgyzstan that they don't want to be, you know, marked and, and heard to say any critical remarks about the government. I've never encountered that before. There was a, a, always a lot of people that were willing to talk about the situation. You, you know, you're working for a, a rights organization too. Are you having, are you noticing this? Are you having any problems getting people to speak openly about the situation in Kyrgyzstan in the last month? I wouldn't say that there was any trouble speaking with people during my last visit in Kyrgyzstan, at least. Um, as you know, I mean, uh, this is one of the, the strengths of Kyrgyzstan is that it's a, it's a quite an open society where people are not afraid to speak their mind. And I think it's, it's uh, great that Human Rights Watch does these uh, legal uh, analysis of, of, the new, of the proposed laws because it shows... Uh, how easily uh, these these new law proposals like this how how it can negatively affect the situation in the country. I think I think that I cannot think of anything that uh, that uh, NGOs in Kyrgyzstan have done that that was uh, detrimental to the development of the country. But I can think of a lot of authoritarian excesses and corruption uh, from the side of the government uh, over the years. Uh, so I think that these kinds of, of uh, new laws where they, and in particular when they, they you see that they copied often verbatim uh, some of the, the law from, from uh, the Russian Federation, of course you get particularly uh, worried about what it can be used for. I don't understand why they uh, in this day and age would be copying laws from a, a sinking ship like Russia. We can see exactly where that leads so I'm worried about the, you know, the, today we, you know, I was just watching the news from uh, what was happening in the parliament in Bishkek, where the, the head of security services was yelling profanity at uh, an MP there. And if, you know, uh, if you have people with a hot temper who have this these kinds of laws uh, that they can be used as an instrument to shut down NGOs, then I think that, you know, there's a good chance they will use them. Uh, not for the good of the country, because you can always, when you have these kinds of laws, it's very easy to find some kind of reason to shut them down. You can say, you know, sometimes they will use this linguistic expertise, uh, things like this that are very difficult to to uh, argue against or to to that that can be used in uh, just just to get the desired result. So I think uh, Kyrgyzstan is, um, you know, it's been through so many rounds of of changes that people are resilient and the society is 
is resilient, but uh, but uh, I think it's it's well worth being wary of these kinds of law initiatives. Maybe I could add add one thing, Bruce, uh, because I, I I can also I can also understand uh, people who are <clears throat> uh, running international organizations in in Kyrgyzstan that they might be uh, concerned about it. And I'm speaking from experience, of course, because the Norwegian Helsinki Committee's office in Bishkek was shut down by the authorities by the security services during Bakiev's time in 2008 and I was uh, deported from the country and became declared persona non grata for like a 10-year period that was uh, removed later so these kinds of crazy things can suddenly happen if you if you your organization is uh, does something or says something that is that irritates the wrong people unfortunately so uh, I can understand where they're coming from if, if you're saying that there are people who are, are worried about speak, uh, speaking their mind on, on, on the radio at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the, giving us your own personal example of the consequences. Sianat, uh, what, what are you, what's your experience with this at the moment in, in Kyrgyzstan? Are people, are people reluctant to talk to you very much about what the current political situation well, I would say that not uh, when we're meeting in person, for example. Um, that's definitely not the case. People are more or less willing to talk, to share um, their uh, their thoughts. But I'm also, I've also not, well, one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of the people are migrating, and I'm talking about specifically activists and human rights defenders and, and lawyers, for example, right, who work pro bono lawyers. Uh, they're all migrating from WhatsApp, for example, into Signal and Telegram. That's one uh, sign, I think, that people are more worried that there, there, there might be there might be wired, there might be bugged, um, and, and WhatsApp is not a is not a very safe um, tool, messenger. So they're m- moving somewhere where, where it is safer, and 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 definitely also one thing that's um, especially I guess in the last months that we can see, I would say if you had been uh, trying to reach out to people, you know, within this month, right, within the past months, the mass arrest of the activists over the Kemperabat uh, dam uh, and everything, it, it actually showed that uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, there has been. And in well, not an investigation, but I guess the interior minister days, or, or was it the Gakenbe? They leaked supposedly a, a, a coup discussion between um, members um, of this committee for protection of the Kemperabat water reservoir, and you know members of this committee make up the majority of the people who who were uh, detained. And question arises like, where did the people? Where did the interior minister or the the, the security? Um, officials uh, get access to to these uh, to these recordings, basically, which were also very clearly, you know, edited, obviously, uh, to make it look like they were discussing constitutional overthrow and other things. Um, and and then later, I, I just heard within the uh, the the community, the the, the activist community, that the place that they had met. Um, all to discuss the situation with Kempirabad and maybe potentially organize a, a protest, a peaceful protest, which is still, um, as far as I know, is not uh, prohibited in Kyrgyzstan, that the place that they uh, gathered was bugged, literally bugged and, and wiretapped. Uh, so that's where um, the, the uh, security uh, officials were able to get all this, um, you know, all the voice recordings. Yeah, and and, and, the, and then um, manipulate it to... Uh, to whatever way they wanted to. So this is also adding into an increasing kind of paranoia, I guess, within the public in general. Well, maybe not the people people, but, you know, the people who are more or less involved in political discussions and, you know, who want to actively participate in, in the public life. So I understand that. And on top of that, you must not forget that, you know, this current um, onslaught, on the civil society in Kyrgyzstan is, 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 it's not something new. It's been happening since at least 2014. Um, I would guess, um, that's when we first had the foreign agents, uh, draft law that was, you know, first introduced. Uh, it was discussed. And since then, we have seen this very relentless kind of, uh, uh attacks on civil society and smear campaigns against civil society. Uh, making sure that people, you know, associate civil society or NGO work with foreign agent kind of work and that all NGO people are foreign agents. And the human rights defenders that I've 
been you know i'm in co- close touch with uh, they're all really burnt out and they're all mentioning how difficult it is for them and, and they don't see any point anymore uh to be honest to travel to rural areas for example uh where they were previously they would um, always you know conduct regular kind of uh discussions i don't know trainings or what have you um nowadays they don't really go there because they know that even if they do go there nobody will come first of all you know to their uh, meetings to their events because everybody will be like, ah, you know, those foreign agents have come again. Um, what do they want now? How, well, like, what tradition do they want to destroy this time uh, in our village? And uh, stuff like that. So I, I would say that it's, um, I agree with uh, Ivor that it's, it is a resilient society, democratic, kish, or at least more, with a stronger civil society than the rest of Central Asia. But it is also getting very, very tired because the, um, you know, <laughs> the regime keeps on changing in Kyrgyzstan. And every time they come with new sort of strengths, new blood and new ideas on how to shut down the civil society, basically, and how to restrict it as much as possible. Whereas the civil, civil society itself, it, you know, it's mo- mostly it's the same people that have been there in 2000, you know, in the early 2000s, in 2010s. Because also since the uh, smear campaigns against uh, civil society have started, and, you know, we could say that's almost eight, what, eight years, maybe 10 years, there, you know, there is no uh, fresh blood, let's say. You know, there there are no new, you know, generations of uh, human rights defenders who might want to come and actually do specifically civic and political rights in Kyrgyzstan. You know, there is, of course, um, activists uh, doing some other things that are not as political. But politically, it's, the, you know, it's people who have been there at the forefront for you know, decades now. And they're, of course, getting tired, very, very tired. And, you know, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. I want to get Ivar in here one more time because he's got to go in just a minute. To, I want to round out this picture as well as possible. Ivar, can you speak a little bit about uh, Next to TV, Bolat Timirov? And, and, you know, laws about uh, disseminating false information. This has all happened this year, pretty much. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I had an opportunity to, uh, to attend his court hearing in, in Bishkek when he was, um, if not fully vindicated, at least, uh, you know, the, the, he came out of there with, from the, the courtroom with, uh, surrounded by friends and supporters who all were very happy that, that uh, many of the charges were dropped. And now it seems, I think, that he's on in the courthouse again today, I think I saw. Uh, it's another of these um, th- these cases where, where you don't quite understand, like, uh, why is the Kyrgyz government damaging the country's reputation in this way? Because it, it it's, it's very clear from the outside and from the inside that this is about pressure on independent media. They don't like uh, some corruption investigation that he's been doing, and so they come up with various various uh, charges against him. Um, they should be dropped, and he should they should stop uh, persecuting uh, journalists, and they should stop, you know, uh, detaining uh, elderly human rights defenders in the street. Uh, the same with, uh, you know... Uh, so not mention that some of that uh, the fatigue may be among human rights defenders, and that's not strange at all because uh, I remember Aziza; she was also the subject of verbal attacks from Atambayev. I remember he was standing on a stage in Bishkek and and like uh, almost you know naming her in particular. Uh, it's just uh, uh, she, you know, both she and Tolikan and and several of the other human rights defenders have really been. The, the foremost uh, patriots in Kyrgyzstan over the past uh, 15 years. You know, when uh, even dur- in, when, uh, during the ethnic clashes in, in Osh between uh, Kyrgyz and Uzbeks, they were not afraid to, to, to be there and to, to tell the truth about uh, what they saw, even when they got criticized by other ethnic Kyrgyz for, for speaking up uh, for the, when they saw violations against uh, the Uzbek side. So they've always been very brave and they've uh, taken the lead. And I think a lot of the younger human rights defenders have learned a lot from them. So it's really just, uh, it, it's uh, unworthy uh, of the current government to, to treat them in, in this way. Uh, and the same, of course, goes with this, uh, the, the, the tension of, of, uh, of the protesters. I think the government should 
uh, instead try to do a better job at explaining their intentions around this um, around uh, Kimira. But I, I read more uh, news than Kyrgyz news than most, and I, I I still don't quite understand what it is their attention is. You know, like if people have the impression that this is bad for the country, then uh, and the government. Uh, considers that they have a, a good plan around it, they should uh, put more effort into explaining it to people what, what's happening there rather than going out and detaining and threatening. Okay, yeah, perfect. Um, thank you very much. And I, I know you could you have to leave pretty soon, so whenever you, you need to go, go ahead. Oh, see you now. That's, uh, you know, I'll get back to you on this too because this is a good point. You know, that the government is having, either has a hard time explaining what's going on or their explanations just don't seem to to be accepted by a lot of the people. I mean, today even trying to trying to calm people down about the Kampirabad Reservoir, uh, the president Sadr Japarov said, Japarov said uh, you know, maybe we could actually maybe we can work out a trade in the future where we get it back. You know, I mean, it seemed kind of ridiculous. You know, what's your sense of of what you, you said you've been talking with people? I mean, does the government have any credibility in its explanations anymore? Is it is the are those explanations reasonable and people aren't listening or don't understand or is it uh, people just lost hope and getting a straight story from the government at all i think the issue is that these explanations are just not being um you know people just don't believe these explanations anymore because they also don't really check out you know uh, when you look into like you know i mean i i can't really you know come up with the specific cases or like of what exactly they said and then you know what what, what happened but um we can see that um so with regards to let's say the border issues right like the the, the contested territories and and there's lots of those territories in the in in, in the whole of Fergana valley basically between kyrgyzstan uzbekistan and tajikistan and there's like you know exclaves and, and, and enclaves on the territory of all the three countries for all the three countries again the, the thing is that, um, and that's what we found actually last year as well, um, when we were doing uh, research in the South on, on water management and water-related um, conflicts uh, between the border sort of uh, communities. Uh, we found that even though there might be some agreements, um, you know, we're not, I mean, we're not uh, border experts, right? So I can't really say, I'm not a politician to say, if this uh, agreement is good for the people or like for Kyrgyzstan or for Tajikistan or whatever, but there are some agreements. So the authorities of the three countries, let's say, they do come to agreement. And then, but then the thing is that this, these agreements are not communicated to people, not just in, 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 in the right way. They're just not communicated at all. And people then on the, on the ground in, in these um, contested areas, they don't even know that maybe, you know, when they're going out with their, uh, with their cattle, right, uh, that they're maybe going on a territory that was, um, I don't know, a week ago was agreed between the, uh, on, on a governor level or maybe even state level that this is currently a no-go zone. Um, but people don't know about this. And then they go in there, then the, um, you know, the, the border guards of the other country will react and then border guards of Kyrgyzstan will, will react. And there is a small skirmish happening, which, you know, in, in April, for example, it really, um, it escalated, um, in Batken and then it escalated this year as well. And, and we're just seeing this result of the complete lack of communication. Um, on the part of the authorities, both national and on, you know, local levels and, and regional levels towards the people. So, of course, with, when there is no information, how are they going to trust whatever that the government is coming up with now? Um, if uh, for so long the people have been just, you know, left on their own and they had to struggle, they had to defend their, their, their houses, uh, their land, basically, and their water usage rights. Um, so I think, yeah, it's just, I completely agree that the government has not been communicating at all. I mean, Ivar mentioned this with regards to the Kempirabad, for example, the reservoir. Why was there such a great need for secrecy? You know, the, 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 the parliament was considering these agreements also in a closed format, even though it's usually uh, possible for people to watch the, uh, the sessions of the parliament, right? But this one specifically was uh, secret. It was closed. Nobody knows what's happening. Journalists were not allowed to go in there. The the authorities, um, you know, the Japara for maybe Tashif and others will make some statements that no, this is actually a, a really good agreement for us, uh, for for Kyrgyzstan. But then it doesn't really provide. It doesn't really open what what is the actual agreement. It just says some things and then you know, 
Um, so, of course, this uh, this secrecy and lack of communication, it really fuels the suspicion and, and, and just yeah, mistrust towards the government. And, 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 and voila, we have our protests. Okay. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, if I could I... add, I think it also you, in in Botkin province, province, you get this feeling of of uh, how unnecessary these and tragic, therefore, these conflicts are. Because uh, uh, in the past, I've traveled uh, to the to the Tajik uh, exclaves. We, you know, t- together with ethnic Kyrgyz, uh, hanging out in these Tajik exclaves, and it's it's it was completely unproblematic, really. You know, the the, the relations between people, you know, that they, you know, that there are tensions, of course, that people are aware of, but it's but it's more or less okay until suddenly it, you know, some con- little conflict starts and, and gets blown out of proportion. But then and then this time on my last visit, we also took a a detour and visited one of. Uh, I think the smallest Uzbek exclave is called uh, Chonkara. There also, it's 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 uh, there, there is absolutely no tension really around that among the people who live there. You're driving along, you're in Kyrgyzstan, you you take a detour, you go on some funny roads, and suddenly you're in a small part of Uzbekistan. We had lunch there, and then drove out on the other side where there's a little, a small border crossing with the border guard that just waves at you, and it it can be completely peaceful and and. Uh, you know, without an, any any conflicts like that. Uh, so, so it, for the people who live there, it seems it just seems to me so unnecessary and tragic that it should develop into these kinds of conflicts where some lots of people get killed. And and then when they start with the, the suggestion that they should have uh, peacekeeping troops from for for the CIS, I can imagine these beautiful areas with uh, with checkpoints and uh, armed guards and and military. It, it's a depressing thought, I have to say. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan. Okay, and I know you have to go. Thank you for leaving me with those comments. So I'm going to leave, give the last word to Sinat. You know, it, uh, it, it seems like the Kyrgyz authorities wouldn't have much support for what uh, it, their current policies are going through. Uh, you know, but we've heard from guests a couple of weeks ago that actually they still do have a lot of support out there. Uh, what do you, what do you, at least in the capital, and really that's where a lot of, the, certainly uh, the last revolution, the last two uh, were decided. What, what's what's the mood out there? What are you getting? What's the sense of the people on the streets when you walk around Bishkek? Are, are, do they get the feeling? I mean, they've been through three revolutions. Do you get the sense that people are thinking that something big is building up here? Yeah, I, I, I agree, actually, with the people that uh, had mentioned that, you know, the, the current government still enjoys a lot of support in the rural areas. Uh, that's for sure, I would say. And also um, our recent, tri- recent trip to Batken also showed people were like, I did not hear people talking or like expressing their dissatisfaction with the government um, and how it's dealing with the, with the border. I mean, of course, it's a, it's a situation of a, of a military conflict already. So people are feeling patriotic and, and they, and, and, and they kind of like trying to support, uh, the Kyrgyz leadership in that sense. But with regards to the, uh, to, to, to the capital, to Bishkek, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I've participated in the several, you know, demonstrations and protests, um, uh, this year that were organized, I think, uh, in spring. Um, and then the recent ones in um, in, in October about Kim Pirabat and, and also demanding the release of the detained people. The, the, these protests didn't really gather a lot of people. And uh, my feeling was that the, the protest potential, I think it's, uh, people are still very, uh, especially the youth, I guess, are very still very uh, disappointed with what happened in October 2020. Um, when we remember, like you remember probably, right? Um, and maybe also the <laughs> listeners that there was this huge sort of this, uh, very charismatic, very like uh, sincere kind of an appraisal. There is, there was a sensation of hope that maybe something is going to change, that, uh, there will be an actual change in the, even in the age of the people who are in leadership, right? Who will be, um, you know, working on, um, leading the government, the, the country, um, in the future. But then it was, I mean, the feelings that it was basically co-opted, it was uh, sabotaged, and it, you know, suddenly it was no longer this the 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 revolution of the youth, but it was a revolution of the same old, same old 
uh, establishment, uh, let's say. It's just a different kind, a different faction of the same old uh, establishment that's come to power. Um, and my feeling is that there is, yeah, there's still a lot of disappointment about it and, and, and um, lack of desire to engage in these kind of things um, further on. So even if there were something massive, um, I don't think it would, I mean, that, that's just my really, that's just uh, my personal thinking. Uh, I don't reckon that it's going to start in Bishkek. I mean, it might end up in Bishkek, which usually has been the case in the previous times, but it's probably, I mean, it's definitely not going to be people who live in Bishkek who will be starting it. Well, I'm well, saying definitely, you. most likely, let's say. <laughs> no, thank you. I mean, like I said, you're there, and I was just I was interested in your impression about what the mood is in the, in the nation's capital. Um, so uh, with that, though, I, I think we have run out of time. So I want to say thank you to Sianat and, and Ivar for being on the program. Uh, and a big thank you to Nathan Shoemaker, our Medjolis podcast producer in Washington, D.C. And a reminder, you can subscribe to the Medjolis podcast or the Central Asia and Focus newsletter by visiting Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's website at rfarl.org. Thank you very much. And we'll be back next week. Bye-bye.